book of Philippians today, the first chapter, the first verse, we're going to be starting to work through. Philippians, the city of Philippi, was in northern Greece in the region called Macedonia. We talked last week that, of course, Paul, on his second missionary journey, saw a vision, went to Philippi, uh, met Lydia, she came to know the Lord, a group of women in a prayer group came to know the Lord. Eventually, he and Silas were arrested, and they find themselves praising God at midnight, and an earthquake occurs, and they are set free, and the Philippian jailer comes, and that question, what must I do to be saved? And uh, Paul is now in Rome. He's in prison. It was one of two places. There was Mamertine Prison, which was a a prison that frankly was not a very nice place. It was one of the, the worst prisons in Rome. But it, we understand that Paul spent some time in Mamertine prison. And then at some point he was allowed at his own expense to rent a house. Still in chains and still with Roman soldiers guarding him. He spent some time and at the end of the book of Acts he's living in his own rented house. But he's still a prisoner. So we don't know whether he's writing Philippians from the prison, Mamertine prison, or from his imprisonment, his house arrest, but he's writing to this church at Philippi where he's had the experiences on his second missionary journey. He revisited it on his third missionary journey at least one other time, and now this time that church has sent a gift, money, to provide for what he was writing on, the parchments for his letters or quills or pens or whatever else it was, maybe for his rented house, we don't know. But they had sent money in the hands of a young man by the name of Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus had traveled from Greece to Rome, found Paul, brought him the gift, and now he's waiting. And then Epaphroditus, when Paul finishes the letter, is going to take it back to Greece. So you almost in your mind have to picture Paul setting it as a table. He's got chains, maybe on his feet, maybe on his hands. He's writing on papyrus with some sort of an ink quill. And he's writing, and as he's writing, he's thinking about Philippi. Now, he's not been there in a long time. But he's heard news, and Epaphroditus has told him, and he's writing a letter back, and he's thinking about Lydia. I'm sure he's picturing the Philippian jailer. He's thinking about individuals and he's writing this letter. Now over the next few months we're going to walk through this letter and look at some different parts but want to begin with chapter 1 and just a few simple things at the beginning and then in verse 3 we'll pick up a little bit. Paul and Timothy. Timothy is with Paul at this time in the city of Rome has evidently left Ephesus and come to be with Paul. Servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. And by the way, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, from a biblical context, the word saint literally means to be set apart. So if you are a Christian, by God, you have been set apart from the world. So you're all saints, every one of us. Not too many of you have halos, but you're all saints from a biblical turn. And so to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Now there are a lot of terms that occur in the New Testament for leaders in the church. This one, overseer, sometimes is translated bishop. Uh, my understanding is that you can have an elder, a bishop, a pastor, an overseer, and for the most part, those kind of all were the same. Now, different churches do it different ways. Uh, but when Paul writes to Timothy at his church in Ephesus, he talks particularly about overseers, bishops, pastors, and deacons. And he gives, in uh, the letter to Timothy, he gives the instruction for the kind of people that a pastor, an overseer is to be, and the kind of person that a deacon is to be. So... He's writing and he's thinking about these leaders in the church. Grace to you. That's the standard greeting from the Greeks and the Romans used the word grace. That's why they said hello. And peace. That's the way the Jews said hello to each other. Those are both words that mean peace, but grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. 
Have you got anybody that every time you think about them, it's good? I mean, you don't have any negative stuff about them. You never have any. I mean, I have a brother. I talked to him. He was in church last Sunday. And most of my remembrances of my brother are good. I got a few. Not many, but I got a few. He says he's got a lot. I don't know how that works out. But I thank my God. He's writing. He's remembering. And it brings joy to his heart. In fact, he's going to use the word joy in this letter more than any other letter. It's just going to show up over and over. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this. And this is, I think, the theme of this letter. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers of me, with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all, that you all, I think he was in the southern part of Rome, uh, yearn for y'all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Well, this is the beginning of the letter, and we're going to spend several months in this letter, but understand there are some things that I think, first of all, we need to understand about Paul and, and of the 13 letters that Paul writes in the New Testament, 13 that we have attributed to him. This one is unique in one sense that I believe Paul, first of all, gives it a personal touch. Now, in all of Paul's letters, he mentions names. In all of Paul's letters, he talks about, and this person is with me, and this person is with me, and we send greetings to you, and he makes reference to this person in your church, and this person there, and he he mentions names in almost every single letter that he writes. Paul, when he writes letters, is writing to people, people that he's met, people that he's known, people that he's led to Christ, people that he's shared in the work in the gospel. He's writing, he mentions Timothy. Later on, he's going to mention Epaphroditus. He's going to mention a couple of ladies, Yodi and Syntyche. Those will get you through the first grade with those names. And so he, gets the, he mentions them by name. He's thinking about people. Now understand, there's a personal element. In fact, if you and I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, You have a healthy relationship. I mean, your relationship with Christ is what it ought to be. You will develop personal relationships with other believers. You will be drawn together. You can't be drawn to Jesus and then be drawn to Jesus and their person be drawn to Jesus without you being drawn together. The Christian life was never intended to be alone. You're to live it in company of other believers. And there's something natural that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul, our strength, and then what's the next one? We love our neighbor as ourselves. And that's the nature of it. And so Paul, when he writes this letter, is very personal. He's talking about his relationship with them. In fact, he gets more personal in this letter than any of the rest one. A little bit later in this same chapter, he's going to say, and I don't know if I'm going to get out of prison or not. I may die. But I don't want you to worry about that because if I die, I'm going to be okay because I'm going to go be with the Lord. And if I could live, that'd be great because maybe I'd get out and I'd get to come to be with you. But but he talks about personal things to the Philippians that he doesn't talk to other people about. Later on, he's going to talk about his past and he's going to say, well, I was a a descendant of of the Pharisees and and I was a tribe of Benjamin and this is how I live my life. And, And then he says, but you know what? I'm not perfect. And the one thing I do is I forget about my past. I don't put glory in it. I don't grieve in it. I don't worry about it. I press on. He gets more personal. He gets down earth with them. It's personal relationships. And I want to tell you that that relationships with other believers, one of the most most valuable things about the body of Christ is that we are together, that we are following Jesus and our relationship with Him is personal, but that ought to get us personal with one another. So in this letter, Paul is very personal about his relationship with the Philippians. There's something natural about that. But he also gives it a prayerful touch. There's a personal touch in this letter, but I mean, he talks about prayer. He says, I pray for you. In fact, next week's sermon is what he prays for them. That's what next week's sermon is going to be. It starts in verse 9. He says, this is what I pray for you. I pray for you. And, And he goes through a whole list of things that he wants them to have and do. But he says, I pray for you. I've tried to imagine, can you imagine what Paul's prayer list must have looked like? 
I mean, I could just show up at his house or show up at the prison and say, Paul, I want to visit with you. He says, not now, I'm busy praying. Come back when I'm done. You're not seeing him till tomorrow. I mean, his prayer list is huge. He's praying for every church. He's praying for all these believers. He's praying for folks in Jerusalem. He's praying for folks in Rome. He's praying for folks in Caesar's household. He's just praying. I have no idea what his prayer list must have looked like. But in this particular one, he goes to great lengths to say, I'm praying for you. And then he's going to tell them what I'm praying about. And it's almost as if he loves them and there's a personal touch that he wants to give but he's here in prison, and they're way over there. But you understand, sometimes we so underestimate prayer that it is one of the ways that you can, for someone who's distant, someone you haven't seen, someone in another part of the world, you can reach out and you can touch them through the power of prayer. You can get God to touch them through the power of prayer. And Paul has time. He's got time to write letters. He's got time to do other stuff. He's got time to pray because he's in prison, but he's praying for people that he can't get to personally. Now, I, I told you the story. I, I know years ago, was preaching in St. Louis at a church, and it was near my parents' house, so I went to stay with my parents. And uh, that's always a little weird when you're an adult and you go to stay with your parents. So, so it's a little different. So I slept, got up, and they're having breakfast at the table and getting ready. And so I sat down for breakfast and the food was on the table. And, and my mother said, well, we're going to pray. You just listen. And so they started praying. And so the first part was kind of, they started praying for me. And they prayed for the sermon I was going to preach that night and what I was going to do. And they prayed for my brother and prayed for my sister and prayed for Karen and prayed for my other uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law. And then they got on to the grandkids and then they started praying for them. And if they knew what they were doing, they prayed specifically for what they were doing. And and it was okay for a while, but my breakfast was getting cold. And they just kept praying. They didn't even stop. And then they went on and they had a list of other folks. And I mean, and, and and particularly, I think my mother prayed longer than my dad did. And they're just praying and it was very sincere and it was obvious that they They did that every day. I mean, they didn't do that just for me. They didn't do that to show. That was the way they began every day, and they had a list of folks that they prayed for and prayed through them. Now, Karen and I don't do it quite that way. We often, for our mealtimes, we pray at the stove is what we do now. We, you know, the food's ready, and we go to the stove because you don't want to get all those extra dishes dirty. You got to get them washed, and so we pray at the stove. It's kind of like praying at the burnt altar. I don't, uh, or not, not that the food is ever burnt, but but we pray at the stove, and, and the food is there. So if you pray for everybody, and we'll make reference to them, but, but we don't pray for everybody at that moment while we're there because the food would get cold. I hope that you have a time in your life on a regular basis. And if it's not every day, I hope that you have a prayer list. I hope there's people that you are praying for. I hope that you're praying for individuals that you know, for family members, for people who are in distant places. And I know you can pick up the phone and call, and you can do Skype, and you can do all kinds of things. But I will tell you, you can touch people in prayer in a way that you can't touch them anywhere else. And Paul, as this example of somebody who is personally connected, has a personal touch with these people, also has a prayerful touch. He's reaching out to them, and he says, I am praying for you, and I hope that you have that time. And by the way, just while we're at it, I just thought as a public service announcement, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. (laughs) Just in case you didn't know that, not that you needed to, but I thought I'd just tell you. And if you really want to know what to do for your pastor, you pray for him. You pray for Steve and I and John. I I don't know of anything that you can do that's even more important. And over the years, I've had church members in our church who, as the years have gotten, have not been able to do the things they used to do. I mean, they used to teach Sunday school, they worked in the nursery, they used to volunteer over here, they used to do, they used to do all kinds of things. And now physically, they are not able to do what they used to do, and that's a grieving thing for them. And they've even sometimes said, Pastor, I, I just can't do anything anymore. I'm no value to the church. And, and I just we got to not underestimate the power of prayer. And if you physically suddenly have time to do that that you maybe didn't have before to invest, then you just start praying. And over the years, some of those individuals who became phenomenal prayer warriors in our church, when I finally had to do their funeral, when we finally said goodbye to them and they no longer had to pray to Jesus from this world because they were in His presence, I personally felt a loss in that I don't have their prayers anymore. From a selfish standpoint, they're not here to pray for me anymore. I hope that you and I understand that Paul reaches out 
and he touches them because he loves them, but then prayer becomes the natural way for him to touch these people hundreds of miles away that he may never ever see again, but he can pray for them. The power of prayer is a significant thing. And so he makes a personal touch. There's a prayerful touch. There's a pastoral touch. Now, the reason I'm putting that in is that that when Paul writes this letter, he's writing it to people, but in the back of his mind, they're just not people, they're a church. So in other words, he's thinking about individuals, but not as individuals. He's thinking about them as a part of the body of Christ. There is a church element. In fact, it's almost in everything that he writes, there's two levels that you and I can read Philippians and just apply it to yourself. You can go home this afternoon, read it, and you say, man, I needed to see that. Yeah, I needed to be reminded about that. That verse is good for me, and that verse is good for me. But in Paul's mind, everything that he writes is also for all of us. It's for the church. It's a group story. It's a group concept. In fact, at one point, he's going to say to two women who have a little issue going on, basically he's going to say, set your personal issues aside because your personal issues are hurting the church. And there are times when we individually need to think about the church as more important than us. I don't know why it came to my mind, but I just personally think my personal preference that if we ever have a potluck dinner, there needs to be lemon meringue pie. I just tell you, if we don't have it, I'm disappointed, I'm upset, but I will tell you, that's just me. And and sometimes when we become a part of the body of Christ, we need to get over me and get on to us. And one of the themes of the book of Philippians is he's going to talk about unity. He's going to talk about needing to be together. He's going to talk about overcoming some issues. He's going to talk about them going on from where they are. And basically, I will tell you, they're a good church. But they still got issues. And and basically, he's saying, you need to move on to some other directions. There's this sense of somehow, it's not just about me. Now, understand, all of us come to church, and we all are us. And we all have our own needs. And you may have come in today and have certain spiritual struggles and certain spiritual issues. And there may be things that you personally need to hear, but that's not the end of it. There always has to be this bigger picture. And I want to just kind of get both personal and pastoral, and then you all can pray for me afterwards. Those are the first three points. Next week, we're going to start again to do a greeting time in our church. Now, you, you know, we stand up, ask you to greet people. And we've done that off and on for years. And we stopped doing it about four or five months ago. And I just kind of want to tell you why, because I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that we're going to start it again. The reason we stopped doing it was because we just was reading some research. And basically, visitors feel uncomfortable in most churches. And when they're asked, visitors say, everybody up, and they, greeted, they stood up and greeted each other. And I felt left out. And it makes visitors feel uncomfortable. So I, I read that, and I was thinking about it. We talked about it as a staff. And uh, so I watched the next couple of weeks after that. And we had visitors in our church. And we stood up, and our people began to greet each other. And we had visitors that nobody said a word to. Now, granted, it's okay to have friends. And it's right to have people that you love and people that you've been worshiping with and people that you care about and people you've been praying for and maybe somebody's had an issue and and it's right for you to go and find them and want to spend time with them and and that's important, but there's got to be a bigger picture. It's not just about you and me and the people I like to be with and the people I'm most comfortable with. It's got to be beyond that. I mean, there's got to be a sense that we need to be mindful that we are the church and anybody who walks in needs to belong. And if I'm greeting the person, quite honestly, that I've known for 500 years because we've been in the church that long. Some of you know Noah got off the ark and you all started coming to church here. I know you've been here that long. Actually, I've almost been here that long, come to think of it. Uh, And there's some of us, we know each other really well and we like each other. Well, most of us. And and we get along really well. And on Sunday morning, if you sit over here and I sit over here, I want to see you and I want to say hi and I want to tell you that I love you. And, And that's all fine. But that's the little picture. That's me personally. That's who I want to see and what I want to do. There always has to be 
from this pastoral standpoint, a bigger picture that says, there may be somebody sitting in the pew next to me that's not even a believer. Somebody who's here looking for a church where they could feel welcome. Somebody here that's looking and they've had a tremendously terrible week and they've got crisis going on and they desperately need somebody just to notice them and think about them. And I will tell you, after two weeks, in both of those weeks, when I saw people who were visiting basically ignored, we stopped doing it almost the next week. And I've shared that with some different folks. So here's the bottom line. We're going to try it again next week. And if there's a visitor, I apologize to him in advance because I hope they're going to get swamped. But I also tell you, by the way, I did think John Fulton was telling me that he and Meredith and uh, Grant, their son, went and visited in a church that was everyone was senior adults. There were no kids in the entire church. And they walked in and every single person just swamped them and went over them and said, oh, we doubt. you want to come? To they were really disappointed when they were just visiting for the Sunday and, and going on. But the, the bottom line is, you, you realize that it's this bigger picture that when I come to church, it is about me, but it's not only about me. That's the personal and the pastoral, and we have to be mindful that we are sensitive to the people around us and what's going on. So we're going to try it again, and, and understand I'm not terribly upset. I'm not terribly worried because there's this other phrase that's in here because there's a personal touch that Paul brings to this letter and there's a, a, a prayerful touch and a pastoral touch because he's going to tell them, here's what you need to be doing as a church. But then there's also not so much a touch but flat out a push. And the push is to keep growing. And he says, God who began a good work in you, and I, Paul's writing this. He remembers. He remembers the Philippian jailer being saved. He remembers Lydia. He remembers them starting. He goes back the next second journey, and he's remembering, and he knows all of He knows how they got started as a church. And then he says, but I am convinced that God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. And then he says, certainly on the day of eternity, the day of judgment. In other words, what Paul says is, yeah, you're a good church, but you're not perfect. Later on, he's going to say, I've been a pretty good man, but I'm not perfect. And the reality is, let me just tell you, there's almost a danger in being a good church. By the way, I think we're a good church. Y'all just nod your head if you think we're a good church. You know, we, we do some pretty good stuff. We're generous, we're gracious, I think we love people, I think we do well, I, I think we do tons of stuff good, but there's a danger in being a good church because that makes you suspect to uh, complacency. We're good, so I'm okay. We don't have to do anything else. There's this sense of, okay, we've done good things, but God still has more for us. There's kind of the, the old classic thing about uh, God... I confess that I'm not what I ought to be. And the truth is, none of us are what we ought to be. We all have shortcomings. We all have ways to grow, both as individuals, as families, marriages, and certainly as the body of Christ. Sometimes we just need to stop and say, you know what, I'm not everything I ought to be. But God, I thank you that I'm not what I used to be. There's this point of looking back and saying, God, I know where I started. I know where I've come from. I, I know who I used to be. And, and Lord, I, I know where I'm at now, and I know that that's not everything. But God, I'm convinced that I'm also not what I'm going to be. And I'm committed to being something more than I am tomorrow. And my mother, just because I've been thinking about her, and I'm thinking about, uh, she was good about measuring us. Do you all know how that stuff, the mark on the wall in the in the parsonage in Bethalto, Illinois. I hope they painted over it by now. Uh, but there were pencil marks all over the closet wall. And we'd go in there, and my brother's older than me, and I always wanted to be taller than him. And today, I think I am. I think he's shrinking. Uh, we're really close. But I always wanted to be taller than him. And we'd back up, and, and Mom would make a mark, and she'd put a date. And then at some point later on, I'd measure us, Mom. Okay, go back in, make a mark. And, and there was times when there wasn't much growth. Sometimes where I'd want to do it like the next day because I wanted to get, me didn't, didn't make any progress. There was a, a year when I grew six inches in one year. Lost coordination, tripped on lines on the floor. I mean, it was embarrassing. But this idea of needing to keep growing, 
And Paul, in this letter, talks about himself. I, I'm not where I need to be. I, I'm, I, I look at the past and I put the past behind me and I press on for the high calling of Christ Jesus. I've got room to grow and I'm not content to stay where I'm at. And as he writes to the Philippians, he says, don't stay where you're at. And I'm convinced God got you started, but you're not done. you got to keep going. He's going to talk next week about what he prays for them. And one of them is he says, I, I pray that your love for each other will abound. It's a word that almost means to explode. He's, I, he says, you've got room to go. There's this element that as Christians, as individuals, in our own families, and as the body of Christ, we constantly have to be looking for what's the next step, God? Where's the next thing, Jesus? What is the next step you want us to do? There must constantly be this growth. And every once in a while, we need to stop and look back and see where we've been and then look forward and see where we're going to be. So next Sunday, I think we can do better about the way we treat visitors and those people are welcome. And by the way, we've had kind of a neat influx in our church and we've got a lot of folks that some of our older people will say, I don't know who those folks are. And... And the bottom line is, if you don't know, then you need to take the initiative to introduce yourself and find out who they are. And you do that before the service. Frankly, you can't do a whole lot of it in three minutes during the service. But before the service and after the service, and you find those folks, and you get to know them, and you make that effort. And and yes, that may take some of you out of your comfort zone. I mean, some of you, if you just can't sit in the pew you've sat in all your life. By the way, how many of you pretty much sat in the same pew all the time? I mean, yeah, you guys are in the wrong pew because you're not up here. You're messed up. Uh, some of you, are, there are a couple of you not even in the right service. You're supposed to be in the first service. I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah, you're not in the right service. You're really confusing things and messes me up big time. But, but there ought to be that sense that when I come here, yeah, I'm here for me. But God, if you've got something bigger, if you've got other people, I, it's not just about me. There's this personal touch, you and me. And there's this prayerful touch. And then there's this pastoral touch where Paul says, okay, I love you, and we've really shared some good things, but guess what? You're not finished yet. You've got room to grow. You've got more that God wants to do. Don't stay where you are. And that's where he says, we've got the goal. And that's never going to change until the day we stand in the presence of God. That's the way life ought to be. Well, today, invitation time. Stipe and know where you are spiritually and where you need to go spiritually. And this is the time where you say, God, I do thank you for where I've come from. And Lord, I acknowledge I got some weaknesses. And God, today I'm committed to whatever needs to change. I'm ready to change to be who you want me to be.